Uh, Catherine Eastman is the sea turtle program manager at the University of Florida's Whitney Laboratory, um, the sea turtle hospital there. And she has been with the program since its inception over seven years ago. As one of the founders, she spearheaded the program from concept to reality. Catherine's background is in environmental education and she helped design and instruct the original education program at the GTM Research Reserve. Catherine's love of nature and the outdoors fuels her passion for conservation. And today she will be telling us about uh, evidence of plastic in ingestion in post-hatchling sea turtles. So Kat, I will hand it over to you. We can hear you now. We can hear me, but we can't see me. There oh, we, go. we could see you. We can? Yeah. I just can't see me. Oh, there I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, Abby, do I have control? If you click on your screen, you should be able to advance. All right, thank you. Um, well, thank you everybody uh, for inviting me or allowing me to speak uh, today at the State of the Reserve. I love this event. Um, and uh, before I get started, I just wanted to say uh, congratulations uh, to Leah, Scott, and Mike for your new positions in the ORCP. I think that's super awesome. And all of us are happy to know that Florida is in your hands, <laughs> or at least our environment. Um, anyway, uh, so I'm going to talk to you guys today about plastic ingestion in post-hatchling sea turtles and uh, assessing this major threat in near shore Florida waters. And I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, particularly several of them, Scott Eastman for really cracking down on um, lockdown writing during COVID, um, because without that pressure, I don't think we would have published it. And uh, additionally to two of my hospital members, uh, one current, one formal, former, uh, Devin Rawlinson Ramia and Rachel Thomas, because without your interest in diving a little deeper and looking on the inside, uh, we would not have even found out any of this stuff. So thank you, uh, both of you guys. Okay, so plastic. Plastics everywhere. It's um, it's found pretty much in every habitat across the globe in a range of sizes. Plastic is the the lart comprises the most um, item in marine debris, and it never disappears. It just seems to get smaller. So we see plastic in its original form, maybe a chair or a cooler or um, even nurdles, the original state of plastic, um, but it continues to degrade and break down into tiny pieces, even pretty pieces like you can see in the inset photo under a microscope. It's almost crystal-like and those fracture lines are part of the, the degradation the, that plastic undergoes from UV light and, and just weathering and, and erosion in the water. So um, it is, uh, it's always there. Uh, this is an interesting graphic because it, it shows you um, pretty much plastic ingestion at all a variety of habitats and by what organisms. And you can see it's pretty much at all trophic levels. Um, the the estuarian, coastal, and offshore um, areas are certainly comprised of the most studies, published peer review studies. Um, and you can see the, the color coding of uh, the different inverts to our, our megafauna. So, um, you know, we have, we have things as large as, as whales and even humans uh, consuming plastic down to little interstitial um, or myofaunal uh, uh, worms eating, eating plastic, which leads us to uh, my focus. 
here we go, sea turtles. And I'm going to thank Ed for um, covering some of the sea turtle life history in, his, in the previous talk, uh, and additionally, the, uh, the different size classes. So um, this is kind of a generic looking life history of sea turtles. And you can see uh, we've got shallow water, habitat, coastal, um, open ocean, uh, nesting beach. So, so basically sea turtles are occupying ocean, ocean habitats in, in a variety of locations. But for, for this study, which was quite opportunistically um, uh, by happenstance occurred, uh, we are focusing on the post-hatchling uh, life cycle or life stage of sea turtles. And that's when a, a hatchling has already left the nesting beach and started its, its migration out to, to the open ocean and began feeding. And after, after it begins feeding, it is a post-hatchling. Now, here's a, a, a map of, of the east the Atlantic coast of Florida, particularly the counties that experience these washback events. So a washback event, so you'll see the, the, the turtles on the right are considered washbacks, so they're five centimeters or greater. And usually they come in with, uh, they come onto the beaches, they get washed in when, when we have hard onshore winds and currents in kind of the fall, late September to Oh, November, mid to late November, um, we'll see washbacks. When, whenever you see the sargassum seaweed mounding up on the beach, well, basically that's little baby sea turtle uh, development ha developmental habitat. So they wash in with their habitat. And so for our particular uh, study um, with the data that I'm gonna show you today, is from two different washback seasons, the 2016 and 2017 washback season, and focusing just on uh, Nassau, Duval, St. John's, and Flagler, which is pretty much the extent of, of where we receive at the Sea Turtle Hospital at Whitney Lab um, those post hatchlings from. And so uh, this here's a, a little size bar you can see this little guy, um, we would measure where that dotted line is. That's how I can say five centimeters or greater. That's the measurement point for, for, um, for sea turtles for straight carapace length. Um, so this in this study, we looked at 42 uh, uh, loggerhead post hatchlings. Um, when these hatchlings come in, a lot of times they're very thin. Uh, they're, they're they're not in a good way. They what, maybe haven't been eating. They're washed around in the swash zone. Um, and so all of the typical morphometrics are recorded for sea turtles uh, to include the location that they stranded from. And before I move on, I just want to let folks know that I do have a couple of graphic pictures. So um, I hope I don't offend you, but um, just look away. I, I don't linger forever. So. Um, uh, once we have uh, washbacks that do not make it or die in our care, uh, we perform necropsies or basically a, a dissection. And this is true with all of our patients. We, we necropsy them to determine cause of death or look for any anomalies. Um, and so with those 42 um, post hatchlings, that's exactly what we did. Uh, and so you can see the top picture with arrows. Uh, this is the underside of the sea turtle where the plastron has been removed and you can see the, the GI tract or the intestines. And so the dissection occurs, we remove the GI tract and you can see where these arrows are uh, observable plastic through the intestine, intestinal wall. Um, Uh, it's important, this bottom picture, just to show that we removed the GI tract in its entirety, um, all the way from esophagus down to the end. And um, with a subset of our uh, data from 2017, we actually located region where we were finding the bulk of the plastic. So um, 
the GI tract is removed, um, organics are removed. So you can see in the, in the image, there's a lot of dark matter. Um, we'll call that fecal matter. So the, the organics and the things that the turtles are eating. Um, additionally, uh, we need to extract all of those organics and, and filter and remove uh, it to see what's, what's left. We, want the, we just want the plastics or the, the little fragments of non-organics. So here's a representation of a clean sample. Um, once we've uh, cleaned a sample, dried it, all of the physical characteristics, color type, um, location in the GI tract are recorded uh, from guidelines uh, from uh, Galgani et al. in 2013. So we use a standardized method that is being used uh, pretty much in a lot of these um, plastic studies uh, across different uh, megafauna. So our results um, of those 42 post hatchlings in our study, 39 had plastic present in their GI. Uh, the plastic quantities range from zero to 287 pieces in one animal. And uh, for size of, of post hatchlings, we're looking at 4.6 centimeters to 7.6 straight carapace length, which I showed you how we measured that. And so now some of the numbers, um, this is from both 2016 and 17. The bulk of what you see that we recovered is, is considered hard plastic. Uh, sheet plastic is kind of like a, a film, if you can think of, um, sort of a flexible plastic. And all of these, by using a standardized method, we're able to kind of put all of our plastics into categories that can be used um, across taxa. Uh, plastics recovered from what location? Uh, I mentioned in 2017, we got a little more in depth, a little uh, stronger with what we were looking for. We, we went into it not shocked and, and looked for it. And so that number uh, was actually 18 animals. And these are the locations across esophagus, stomach, and intestine. So you can see that turtles are eating the plastic and it is making it through, somewhat through uh, their, their GI tract. And then the number of turtles that ingested each type of plastic, uh, you can see that um, we're real close to eating a lot of a variety. Um, so a high number of our turtles, or of these, sorry to call them our turtles, <laughs> um, consumed hard sheet um, and thread uh, balloon, not so much. It's about half, half the animals. Industrial plastic is something pretty uh, like the virgin plastic, the nurdles people are familiar with, um, I think. And then the size, we thought it was important to kind of look at the size of all of this plastic and the bulk of the plastic is, um, as you can see, is less than five millimeters uh, in, on its longest edge. Uh, and so plastics are divided into macroplastic, microplastic um, based on size. And so, you know, that allows us to think some of this is um, turtles are visual feeders. Uh, another interesting aspect was to look at color. Um, and I will draw your attention to white since it doesn't have a color. It's, um, it is the highest number of, um, of plastic pieces. Uh, one thing. Three minutes. One thing that we look at and we assume is that plastic um, eventually turns to white. So the color is lost over time. So quick summary, plastics are a global problem for all species when we're seeing it at our local level. Um, we've identified and characterized the plastics within those po post hatching GI tracts. Um, interesting, once we published this paper over the summer, uh, we had folks reach out to us from the University of Michigan offering to take a closer look at our plastic and try to identify it. So we sent some samples up to Brian Love and, and Keon um, Bigzita, who are in the um, materials science and engineering department. And this is just one of the samples. Uh, this is sample number seven. And they were able to kind of establish for us um, a molecular fingerprint of, of each type of plastic. So this uh, number seven uh, looks like uh, recyclable number one or uh, polyethylene tetraphthalate. 
And so we can determine those things based on several of their, um, their high-tech uh, uh, methods to include FTIR, uh, which, is, um, which we didn't have access to. And we're super happy to continue to work uh, with them. But basically, uh, most of the samples were identified as common uh, industrial polymers. We did not identify a smoking gun. Um, but so some next steps, we openly published on 2016 and 17 data. We have it all the way to 2020 uh, data. Since we've opened back in 2015, um, we've had 888 post hatchlings or washbacks to date. Um, so we'll continue those uh, necropsies as well as um, looking for tissue trauma, uh, impactions and other damage in, in fresh, fresh dead uh, post hatchlings to determine cause of death. Um, that's always the question that we're asked was, did the plastic ingestion cause that, their death? And um, it's really hard to, to prove that. So uh, additionally, we'll be looking at tissue samples from the organs to look for disease markers or inflammation or, or just to try to further uh, some of this research. And thank you again. I have to put this out there. Um, besides my co-authors and the folks that I work with on the daily, I do have to thank all the sea turtle volunteers, uh, whether they're the patrol volunteers that spend countless hours out on the beach collecting these guys, uh, transporting them to us uh, or other facilities. Additionally, the hospital volunteers that provide the care uh, feeding and care to over you know hundreds that we receive each year. So I just did want to acknowledge the volunteers uh, before I take questions. And thank you, everybody. Thanks, Kat, for that great presentation. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from the chat box. Um, can we expect that the plastic levels would be higher in these turtles that are these post hatchlings that are washing up versus those that do not wash up? Maybe they're weakened by the plastics? That could be. Um, I, would, I would speculate to say that, yes, if you're able to eat small enough plastic that your body can pass it and you don't um, become weakened, if we're calling you know, plastic uh, overconsumption of, or contributing to your death or to your uh, sick, um, yes, I would say we'll see less out there. However, this impacts all life stages. So um, I think if you're, if you can get through the post hatchling size and grow large enough that your GI is large enough and you can start passing plastic, um, you know, you make it to the next phase. But uh, like I said, we're, we see it at, at all levels of the sea turtle life history. Interesting question. Thank you. Another question is, are there other turtle hospitals that are performing the same type of necropsies and are the data being rolled up or collected nationally? Well, um, yes, I can speak for Gumbo Limbo uh, Nature Center, their hospital. We are collaborating with them on a, a larger project um, and uh, they did get a lot of uh, press, I think over the summer or earlier on, um, I think even Good Morning America or something featured some of their their um, their post hatching washbacks. So uh, we reach out together, and and yeah, we'll be working together. Um, hopefully, really really soon. We're picking up samples next week from them, actually. Awesome. Can you non invasively image plastic either on or in live animals? Do you have that capability? No, no, I, I mean, I'm Mark, <laughs> Martindale. Um, no, I mean, it would be great to be able to laparoscopically look in, but they're too tiny. These GI systems are so small. Um, to start out with, you have a small animal. Um, um, no. I'm going to say that, you know, they, by x-raying, you know, we, we can see things, but we can mostly just see um, 
uh, you know, that the intestines are full, but we can't identify an individual piece of plastic per se in the intestine. Got lots of questions. I should open the chat. And we'll, we'll take one more and then if you could stick around and answer some of the remaining questions. Our last question will be, what do you do with the washbacks who survive? So yeah, it's not all gloom and doom. Um, so from that, uh, from those two years that were in the study, um, we had 396 washbacks between those two years. Uh, 293 were successfully released. So um, that's, that's are still good numbers. So the 103 that died in care, uh, we, we took a subset of, uh, of 42 to, to actually um, necropsy. But um, again, we opportunistically found this, found this stuff. So then now we're like, we look at every single one that dies in care um, or comes in dead. So uh, yeah, thank you for all the great questions. Thanks, Kat.